it is my distinct pleasure um, to introduce um, a colleague here of mine at the Colorado State Library, um, Jean Heilig, who is our fiscal officer. And so I'm going to bring up Jean's slides here. And Jean, I will um, let you take it away. Thank you so much, Christine. Welcome, everybody. I'm thrilled to have you with us today. You know, when I first started putting together um, the idea for this webinar, it was probably about last October or November. I, um, you know, talked to Christine about it. And I said, well, what, what would you think about doing, you know, something about online communication since we've been in our offices now for, you know, so much time? Well, at that point, it'd been about nine or 10 months. Um, do, you know, do you think other people would really appreciate it? Because I knew that I needed to know more about how I could improve my communications online because I was doing so much of it. I mean, I had weeks where I would have 17 Zoom meetings, I think it was my all-time high in one week. And I knew that there was something that I needed to do to become more effective um, in how I was coming across to people. And so we decided that it would be a great idea. And, and so far it has been. But, you know, once the vaccination started rolling out, you know, and I thought, well, you know, maybe this is going to kind of die off a little bit and you won't have quite as much interest. And, you know, once we started getting into, you know, the um, spring or, you know, early summer, summer um, time period, I thought, well, you know, maybe it just had a really short run. Then the Delta variant hit. And, you know, I, I know that it's different all across, you know, the United States, all across the country, the different countries, as far as um, how heavily impacted you are. But I know that here in Colorado, we're having our struggles. And, you know, since both Christine and I work for the, for the state library, we're underneath the Department of Education umbrella. And whereas um, previously we could work in the office if we so chose to, and if we were vaccinated, we didn't have to wear masks. But you know, we just got a message yesterday from our commissioner saying that now if we go into the office, we do need to start wearing masks again. And they've kind of delayed our rollout of returning to the office as well. So things are starting to change again. And I think that's probably going to be the way it's look, going to look for the next, um, you know, at least the next year, I would imagine, is that we're going to be in a constant state of flux. But there's one thing that's always going to be consistent, and that's online communication, is whether we're doing more of it or less of it, we're still going to be doing some of it. And I think it's something that we can all um, really learn about how we can come across better um, to the people we're, we're talking to. And also, um, one thing, Today, um, of course, I'm working from home from my home office, and today is lawn mowing day, and I have my windows closed, but I'm expecting the leaf blower to come by at any minute. Of course, it'll come by right in the middle of, of my presentation, so please forgive me. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, so why does this matter to you? Uh, because successful relationships, whether they're in our personal or our professional lives, really depend on effective communication. And communication can make a difference between life and death in an emergency, between divorce and reconciliation in a marriage, between profit or loss in a business. Yet many people still disregard the importance of communication in the online world. Um, now that such a considerable, considerable amount of our daily lives is facilitated by the internet, digital communication skills are essential to ensure that messages are delivered and received correctly and virtual wires are not being crossed in the process. Um, there are some forms of online communication that don't really allow immediate feedback. So it's essential to present compelling messages in a one-way setting in order to be successful. And as we all know, there are many chances to improve, improve the first impression someone may have of you. So what I refer to um, throughout this presentation is netiquette, and that is the framework of accepted behaviors when communicating online. And in many ways, the importance of netiquette exceeds that of in-person etiquette, because unlike fleeting acquaintances, the Internet creates a permanent record of communications which can haunt people and libraries that have been ineffective or offensive in previous online interactions. You know, if you think about um, FOIA requests, the Freedom of Information Act requests, where, um, 
you know, a library patron or a cons some kind of a constituent can request all email communication between, you know, yourself or your agency and another agency. And we have to give that information if we're a government agency. So um, these are things to think about and why they are important. And I always like to lead off with a few, few facts about it. And I like this quote, it's how you, it's, um, you know, communication is all about, you know, how it's how you looked when you said it, not what you actually said. And Albert M Morabian probably butchered his last name, but he was a pioneer researcher of body language in the 50s, found that the total impact of a message is about 7% verbal, meaning it's just the words alone. Yet 30% is vocal, and that includes the tone of voice you're using, the inflection, and other sounds, and 55% is nonverbal. So therefore, 93% of communication is nonverbal. If you think about that, you know, 93% of the communi communication can be lost in an email. 55% can be lost via a phone call or through a, a Zoom call or a Zoom meeting. Um, anthropologist um, Edward Hall calls this the silent language, which is body language. And so we, what we really need to work on is to translate in-person body language to such things as punctuation, video call first impressions, abbreviations, signatures, and the time it takes us to press the send key. There's a great book, and I highly recommend this, um, to either buy it for yourself personally or to get it for your library co connect collections, because I think your patrons would really enjoy it as well. It's called Digital Body Language. It's by Erica Dewan, and I um, thank Christine for turning me on to this book, because I've read it cover to cover. It's very good. And the next few slides we're going to go through are um, just some ideas that she talks about in the book of how we can actually kind of convert our um, regular body language into digital body language and to be just as effective at it. So the first one is contemporary speech relies more than ever on how we say something rather than on what we say. And so that's our digital body language. 70% of communication among teams is virtual. Average person sends 30 and reads 96.3 emails. And 50% of the time, the tone of our emails is misinterpreted. You know, we've all gotten the emails that are all capitals, or they're all bolded, or there's a lot of exclamation marks, a lot of question marks, and we're kind of scratching our heads, wondering how we're supposed to be taking it. So if you want, you know, you, these are some tips that you can use. If you want to show interest and, um, and being a be approachable in your emails. In traditional body language, if we were talking to somebody, we would, you know, nod our head, bob our heads up and down. We would smile. We would open our arms, showing that we're approachable. We would uncross our legs. And what that's called is more of an open profile so that we're open to receive information. And we're open to also um, give information as well. We're not closed off. So how does that translate into the digital environment? Well, what you can do is to respond promptly to a text. You can reply to an email with well thought out comments instead of just, you know, throwing something out, you know, in the reply and sending it off, but actually think about what you want to say and then rereading it making sure there aren't grammatical errors, making sure that there aren't punctuation errors. If you're in a virtual meeting, you can use a thumbs up. And that way, what you're doing is you're letting the um, speaker know that you're actually listening, that you're absorbing, that you understand what they're trying to say. Um, or in the chat box, you can write things such as, that, such as, I completely agree with what you're saying. Because they can't necessarily see you nodding your head and smiling, you know, in agreement with what's being said, but you can just tell them. So these are just a few small things that you can do in the virtual environment. Now, as far as listening attentively, in um, the physical world, 
you know how it, um, I love this with dogs. We'll do this if they're listening to you and they kind of tilt their head a little bit and you know that they're listening and they're trying to to reason what, what you're trying to say. Well, people do it, too. You know, they may tilt their head to one side and oftentimes they'll nod it. They'll make verbal affirmations like, mm hmm. Oh, I see. OK. Comments like that. So it shows that they're being engaged. There'll be eye contact. They'll smile at you and open positive body language. No crossing of arms and legs. Their legs will be pointing towards you. Their knees will be pointing towards you, not away in a different direction, like they want to escape from the situation. So how do we translate that into the digital body language? It's as simple as liking a text, praising another person's input in an email, making a detailed comment verbally or in the chat box during video meetings when someone expresses an idea. And I really like this next quote, reading messages carefully is the new listening. And that is so very true. I, um, at one point in time, had a supervisor who, when they would receive emails, they would only, they oftentimes check them on their phone. So they would only read the first sentence of an email. And after that, nothing was read. So we learned very quickly to put the most important thing in that first sentence, because we knew that they weren't going to listen to the rest of our message. So it's, um, you know, that's just a sign of, of consideration and a sign of showing that you are listening to what the person has to say is by reading that message carefully. And the next one is smiling. You know, in traditional body language, well, you know, you can tell if somebody's smiling and you can tell if it's a fake smile or a real smile because real smiles, you'll see the corner of people's eyes kind of lift up and they'll crinkle a little bit. Whereas a fake smile, it's usually not the whole face doesn't light up. Um, it's just kind of a real strained um, movement of the lips. And with a real smile, it's very contagious. If one person starts smiling, another person will start smiling or you'll start smiling back. And it really affects the areas of the brain that's linked to happiness. And if you feel a stronger sense of connection when somebody smiles back at you. Um, I know I feel this way when I'm out walking. Um, I always smile at somebody when I pass them on the street, when I'm walking on the sidewalk. I always smile and say good morning, good afternoon, or whatever, because it makes me feel connected with them. And when I see them the next time or the next day, you know, we always speak again. And it gives me that connection with my neighborhood. So how do we relate to that um, in the digital body language? Well, using exclamation points and emojis within reason. And, you know, emojis are becoming more and more acceptable and that's fine, but I think they have a time and a place. So I need, I think you need to read your company's um, or your organization's culture to see if they are acceptable or if the person on the other end is going to be receptive of emojis. Um, adding a simple, have a great weekend to the end of an email. You know, I like to show that I care um, with, for people. And I just say, you know, take care of yourself at the end of an email. Um, you can show up by laughing during a video meeting. That helps a lot too. Oh, I love it. fake smiling by crinkling her eyes under her mask. I love it. That's great. <laughs> that makes me laugh. So let's, let's talk a little bit about email netiquette. Um, you know, there are some forms of online communication don't allow immediate feedback. So it's really essential to present compelling messages in a one way setting in order to be really successful. And, you know, writing clearly is really the new empathy and empathy is a new buzzword. It's starting to appear in education curriculum, in value statements, political campaigns, in media conversations. And it's seeing situations clearly from others' perspective can transform leadership types, work cultures, and business strategies. But unfortunately, reading emotion within the digital nature of the modern workplace, um, it, it's difficult. It really is. 
So um, what was implicit in traditional body language um, is really now explicit in our digital body language. So now let's, let's take a look at um, what I'd really like you to do is in the chat box, I would love for you to write in there, what makes you crazy about emails? Maybe it's an email you've received. Maybe it's an email you sent. What makes you crazy? Absolutely, all caps, because you never know how to take it if they're yelling at you. Incorrect grammar makes me nuts as well. Spam, <laughs> yes, yes. In fact, that brings up, you know, I'll, get, I'll tell you one of my bugaboos, and it just happened to me yesterday, is um, I had a library send me um, a pretty important document that I needed to process, only they had scanned the document from their library um, printer and had sent it directly to my email address. Therefore, there was no message in the email, there was no subject line, <laughs> title, nothing, the only, you know, the only reason I knew it was from a particular library is because fortunately the email address it came from had the name of the library in it. Because otherwise I would have deleted it um, because of the spam and phishing schemes that are going on right now. In fact, we just got a huge um, email from our IT department about being aware of these phishing schemes that are going on right now. And of course, we all know that you shouldn't open attachments from unknown sources. So that makes me crazy. <laughs> oh, oh, you guys are, are really rocking on. You, <laughs> we all know what makes us crazy, don't we? <laughs> yes, reply all. Yes. <laughs> and it's interesting how many are mentioning kind of just like, you know, at least give somebody like the benefit of a greeting. You don't have to go like on and on before you get to the point, but just some common courtesy at the beginning of an email. Agreed. I couldn't agree more. See, so some kind of feedback when you've um, sent documents so that you can be sure that it was received on your end. But I also like to have um, some kind of feedback when I've got to a great amount of work on something for someone and I've sent it to them, you know, a thank you would go a long way and there are many times when i don't get them so i you know i understand that christine is wonderful about that by the way she always responds to emails even if it's just a little emoji it's wonderful i like what karen said. yeah that's a good one not changing the subject line yes um, and Karen has a good point. Start with a greeting, get to your request, what you would like to have done, and then sign off. That's probably, <laughs> I wonder, Jen, Jen just scanned a, um, a book I span into the chat, <laughs> which is delightful. <laughs> I thought maybe that was how many unread emails she had. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, these are all great. Looks like everybody has some feelings about emails. <laughs> it's a little trigger. <laughs> We're all a little passionate about it, aren't we? <laughs> well, with, with that said, let's go ahead and go on. I mean, that's great. Thank you for your feedback. That's exactly what I was looking for. So let's talk about some of the do's and the don'ts. And these are just a handful that I'm going to give you. Um, you know, and this, of course, there's one thing to really remember is that writing is hard. It's not easy, you know, even if it is just a few lines in an email. It, honestly, few of us do it well. We, you know, it's, um, but we do need to take the time and we do need to sometimes practice those emails, especially those emails. Um, we call them flaming emails. The ones, those are the ones that where somebody sends you an email and it just really irritates you so badly and you just immediately start you know crafting a reply and you want to hit send well i'm here to tell you 
don't touch the send key. Instead, keep it in your drafts. Just keep it, sit on it, sleep on it. In the morning, take a fresh look at the email that was sent to you, and then recraft it rewrite it. I can guarantee you, you're going to want to rewrite it because you're going to be feeling much differently than you did. Then send it. So that's what's called flaming. You know, just if you feel your temperature starting to rise a little bit when you see the email, then step back a little bit. Um, it's also important to remember that, you know, there's a real person on the receiving end, although we can't always see them. So you are actually talking to a real person. Um, you know, and, and you're so right, Karen, no need to rush. It shouldn't be that urgent. You know, we don't perform brain surgery. We're librarians. You know, usually it can wait for us. Um, the, you know, the, the rule of thought is that you really should try to reply within 24 hours. And if you can't, let the sender know that you can't. And also, um, make sure that you're using your out of office um, it's nothing is more frustrating to me when i need something and i've sent somebody an email and it's crickets for a week i don't hear anything and i don't have a clue that this person is out on vacation so you know i really think it's just a matter of um, common courtesy to use your out of office um, notification in your within your email i'm um, also you know you want to take the time to write more thoughtful responses. Um, let them know when you'll get back to them. And this is kind of a, a cool tip is to schedule time in your calendar to craft that response, especially if it's a longer response. That way it's just not hanging out in your inbox and getting buried by all the other email that comes in. And I, yes, I am guilty of that. So if you actually schedule a time in your calendar, it will get taken care of. Um, be really careful when you with the reply all button. Use it really sparingly. Only reply to those people that really, really need to know this information. Um, don't clutter their email boxes with with um, needless, you know, with um, well, you know what I mean. Subject lines, please use them. Um, leaving them blank, it's a wasted opportunity. Um, and in addition, it can be interpreted as informal and maybe even disrespectful, um, and especially with older recipients feel that way. For example, at the um, State Library, actually it's the Department of Education, there is one person that does the smart sheet licenses for the entire Department of Education. And when she does the annual renewal for these licenses, she sent out the best email subject line I ever have seen. And in it, she said, action item, colon, smart sheet licenses, fiscal year 21-22. That way, if you didn't need a, a smart sheet license, you can right away delete the email. If you needed a smart sheet license, then you knew that an action was required. It was amazing, you know, how wonderful that was. But you know what? Nobody does that. Nobody does that. So, I, you know, I thought that, um, am I doing it? No. And I, this is a good reminder for me. That this is something that I need to start doing as well, much more often. Um, you know, and you want to be pleasant in your emails. And we already talked about this, you know, opening and closing your emails with the pleasantry. You know, it could be, dear John, it could be, hi, um, anything. I close it with, I hope you are well. I hope you're doing well. Take care. Um, have a nice weekend, have a great evening, whatever. Now also long blocks of text will put some people off. So try to use subheadings, bullet points, and lists. And that way it'll break up the content into digestible chunks that look less daunting on the screen. Emails that are longer than five sentences tend to get skimmed over. Remember that. I know that I have a really hard time with big blocks of text. I would much prefer, um, you know, paragraphs and bullet points, um, indentations, whatever, to just break it up a little bit. I find it to be so much easier to read on the screen. Um, and as we've already said too, don't yell at people. Please don't yell at people. Don't use all capital letters. 
Um, you can use them to draw attention to something important, but just be careful that it's obviously not trying to convey that you're angry or upset. And you also want to avoid sarcasm because it really doesn't translate well in online um, settings. And, you know, you, one other thing, and of course, this goes without saying, and I saw it in one of the comments, is that, you know, you want to really develop a good working knowledge of vocabulary and grammar essentials. And if you're in doubt, always check. You know, it's so easy to just Google something to find out, you know, do I need a comma? Do I need a period? Do, you know, how do I really spell this? Um, you know, and remember to proofread for clarity, not just for grammar and punctuation. Um, you know, I mean, I look up words all the time to make sure I'm using it correctly. I'm, you know, I'm a librarian like the rest of you. I read a lot and I have these words that pop into my head and I think, well, that, you know, is that really appropriate for the sentence? So I just look it up to make sure it is. Um, so just try to get into the habit of that. So, so let's, let's um, jump into bone netiquette. We do use phones. You know, I find that I don't use phones as much probably as some people do. I've always been kind of a, um, I don't know, I don't like being on the phone. I don't like talking on the phone. And I never have, even when I was young. I just, that's not something, you know, if my, like if my family wants to get a hold of me, they know that the best way to do it is to send me an email or a text. Those I'll, I'm more than happy with, but phone calls I don't do real well with. But unfortunately, in the work environment, we do have to make phone calls. You know, um, it, it, you know with, with phone calls, you've got to make sure that um, there are some, some things of netiquette that we need to be aware of. Um, in fact, when do you make a phone call rather than send an email? Well, if you really want to reach somebody quickly, and um, maybe it's somebody who doesn't normally check their email very often or, or who maybe has shows delays in responding. And sometimes it's better to pick up a phone if you want to avoid video burnout. And that's for private conversations or when you don't want the message to be copied or distributed. So let's talk a little bit about in the chat box, what makes you crazy about phone calls? Other than just having to talk on the phone, like. I just said. Yeah, small talk and using the speakerphone. Like my husband always has the phone on speaker and um, I just never think about it. So like, you know, he'll be in the grocery store or something and I'm on speakerphone and I have to, you know, potentially watch my language. Yeah, speakerphones yes, can be very dangerous. Yes. And don't call somebody to tell them that you just sent them an email, as somebody said. <laughs> Sometimes people aren't prepared. Well, I know. And, and I know that you would put it in the um, chat box, you know, about using Teams for, as a mode of communication. And I'm a terrible offender of this about using Teams. I forget to open it in the mornings. So people will be trying to call me and I'm oblivious because the app, the application's closed. So that's one thing you can do is make sure your, all of your applications are up and running when you start work in the mornings. Oh, yeah, and uh, robocalls and spoofed numbers, you know, we have to kind of decide what phone calls we're going to answer. And Daisy has a good point, like, how do we tell people to stay on topic when they do call? It's, um, it can, since email is not synchronous, it can be a little bit easier to kind of, you know, do it on your own time. Um, but phone calls, it's a little bit harder. And how to end the call, yeah. I find that with um, chat applications too, like you chat somebody, you ask them a question and it's sort of, then it's just sort of like, do you just like leave it abruptly? Do you say bye? I never know what to do. <laughs> I know sometimes you have to be a little um, um, strong in the conversation to try to steer things back to, you know, what you were originally talking about or what the key business was um, where you had started. 
um, by saying, you know, I know, I know that your time is limited, you know, and I don't, I don't want to take a lot of it. So, you know, can we get back to what you know, we were originally talking about, you know, something like that, so that it's, it's more about, you know, being considerate of them um, to bring that conversation back around again. And, and calling places that have the phone tree <laughs> is just, yeah, <laughs> where you never know, like, I just need a person just a person I'll be like walking around my house screaming into the phone I just need a person <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, and having people answer especially remembering to do that at home if um, very few people will call me at home for work even though I'm working at home um, it's mostly done via email but like yeah if I just answer hello they don't know that they've gotten the right person yep these are great They are very good. Thank you, everybody. Now, there's just, just a few things to take into consideration when you are making a phone call is um, one thing that, that I like to, to think is that um, always assume that the other person is busy. So that, you know, you don't tend to go down, you know, those little rabbit holes about having these conversations that probably aren't terribly relevant. Because even though we see it in other people, I'm sure that we also see it in ourselves as well. So we need to try to stay on track as much as possible. Um, another thing that's really helpful is to put it on your calendar. Schedule your phone calls. So that in this way, you're not um, forgetting to make them. And you're knowing you've got documentation that the phone call was made as well. When answering the phone, your greetings should clearly identify your library and your role or your name. And you want to speak slowly and clearly so that you can be very easily understood. And I'll tell you, I have a hard time understanding a lot of people on cell phones um, because Either the connection is poor on my end, or it's poor on their end, or they're out walking their dog, or I'm walking mine. There's so many distractions and noises and whatever. So, you know, I, I think that if you're going to be, um, you know, doing this for business, you need to be in a quiet place where you've got some good cell service and um, you're not constantly fading in and out. I know with cars, it's, it can be really difficult to hold a decent conversation when you're in a car. Um, and if you're driving, of course, you shouldn't be holding a conversation, but we know that, that it happens, um, especially with hands-free dialing and all of that now. Um, also, if the caller is asking you a question, Make sure that you acknowledge it by restating at least part of it. It also means that you're um, understanding it and you're hearing it correctly. Use minimal encouragers like, uh-huh, go on, that's interesting. You know, they're, they're especially important over the phone as cues that you are listening. Um, and sometimes without these encouragers, the callers have to wonder if you're still there. Um, I'm, I'm always doing that with my brother. It's like, Jerry, are you still there? Because it'll be like dead silence on the other end of the phone. And I don't know if we've lost the call or what. And he's like, yeah, I'm here. It's like, oh, great. Um, and you smile when you're on the phone because smiling really can't, can um, convoy a, a warmth in your voice. You know, it, it comes out in the way that you talk. Does anybody else have any any um, any other ideas of what could help the phone interaction be better? I know that we've already seen a few come through here, but I haven't been able to keep up with the chat. Did you see anything that that stood out, Christine? A couple of people mentioning like um, uh, leaving your phone number at both the beginning and the end of uh, leaving a message. Um, and Daisy makes a good point about if you are um, talking to a patron that you know it, it kind of makes sense to repeat the patron's question to make sure that you're hearing them correctly but then you're also you know there can be confidentiality issues so um make sure you leave the date and time when you call um 
That's excellent. I'm glad somebody brought up the point about leaving the phone number a couple of times at the beginning and the end, because what I find is that most people will leave the phone number right at the very beginning. And I don't typically have a pencil and a blank piece of paper in front of me at the time so that I can write that information down. But by the end of the phone call, I will. Um, so, you know, I, I, really appreciate you saying that because I think you should do it in both places, both at the beginning and at the very end as you're um, hanging up. So these are great. Thank you all very much. I love Ooh, it when we get tips from each other. And spelling out your email so that, you know, you can, in, you know, so you can get um, a reply via email if needed. Especially if you have a difficult name to spell, you know, such as mine. Um, I... <laughs> I had somebody email email me the other day as Jean Hellig, H-E-L-L-I-G. It's like, hmm, you trying to tell me something? But, you know, because it happens all the time. Wonderful. Let's talk about virtual meeting netiquette. Zoom fatigue. What makes you crazy about virtual meetings? Why don't you write it in the chat box? People can see my pups distracting me. I actually lock mine up. He's locked up downstairs so he can't distract anybody. <laughs> I only attend meetings to see pets. That's the only reason I want to attend meetings these days. So <laughs> not muting. Yeah, like we've all done it. I've done it, but like, or then figuring out how to unmute. We would think that we would all know how to do this different kinds of apps yeah everyone works differently coming to the meetings unprepared yes people eating and combing and brushing their hair i, I don't think i've combed my hair during a meeting before but yes do it performing yeah grooming yes on the call yes yeah or having a meeting that could have been an email or a phone call and it's when when presenters don't understand how to use the platform yes i have had to use like at the beginning of the pandemic zoom was was i didn't know a lot about it but we've had conferences and meetings and that kind of stuff and so i made it like part of my job to learn how to use it because um, otherwise you can't share the information you want to share and and i'll be honest with you if you do a lot of presenting um Christine has been a godsend for me because she's actually offered to help me when I've been doing presentations outside of CSL in session. Um, she's offered to attend my sessions and to help um, should I have problems with the software because she has become such an expert on the different platforms. And it really gives me um, um, a sense of calm when I'm presenting, knowing that I've got, you know, somebody's got my back. So it helps if you can find somebody that can do that for you. Yeah, I think only once I kind of was my own tech support for a webinar. And now I try to make sure um, that a colleague or something can be um, a backup. Because if something goes wrong, I can't present and address that issue at the same time. Ooh, meeting host not responding to chat. We try to pay attention to chat, which is another reason why I am on with Jean today. I can help her monitor the yes. chat. Yes, because I'm, I'm, I can never keep up with both. <laughs> yeah, and if you have a meeting for a half an hour, like don't have it last for an hour and a half. And I've, I'm trying to get better about even, I typically schedule meetings for an hour, but um. I'm trying to like think about like how much time does this actually need and trying to do better because like otherwise you just go meeting to meeting to meeting and it's they're all hour long and it's like it's like a purse you can make the meeting fit however much time you have just keep jamming things in there. Yeah, I've been having technical requirement meetings that have been two hours in length and let me tell you it's been very difficult. 
very difficult. So, you know, I, um, yeah, I, I relate. I understand completely where you're all coming from. I don't think I've had one yet where Alexa was chiming in. That's interesting. Oh, that is interesting. Oh. Oh, the cat had to be put away. It's like, I hope he didn't have to be put down. Put away is okay. <laughs> yes, people texting, watching TV. Oh, geez. Yes. So let's talk a little bit about Zoom fatigue. I'm sure you've all have heard the term. Um, it describes the tiredness, the worry or burnout associated with overusing virtual platforms or of communication. Um, I really experienced this. It was um, two days ago. I did another webinar. It was a grant implementation webinar, and my assistant, Melissa, um, helped me with it. And it was a very active one hour session. I mean, we had a lot going on. And then immediately after that, with no break, we had to sit in a two hour um, technology requirement meeting that was um, slow and it was very draining and very, um, you know, one of those that you really had to pay attention to because you had to participate. And after we were done with these meetings, we um, met up over um, teams to talk about, you know, the, the results of the meetings. And she looked at me and she said, I'm exhausted. So, you know, I am too, because being on these meetings for, you know, three plus hours really is exhausting because, you know, you're constantly on and you've got people staring at you, you know, for long periods of time. You know, I mean, nothing really fosters Zoom fatigue like a day full of meetings that probably could have been an email or meetings where you weren't personally needed in the first place. So, you know, Zoom fatigue really comes from um, many different factors. And let's, let's talk about a, a few of them. You know, if you think about it, excessive amounts of close-up eye contact is really intense. And both the amount of eye contact we engage in on video chats, as well as the size of faces on screens is really unnatural. Everyone is looking at everyone all the time. A listener is treated non-verbally like a speaker. So even if you don't speak, even once in a meeting, you're still looking at faces staring at you. Faces can appear too large for comfort. On video, you're seeing faces at a size which simulates a personal space that you normally experience when you're with someone intimately. So what's the solution to that? You can take Zoom out of the full screen option and reduce the size of the window relative to the monitor to minimize face size. And you can use an external keyboard to allow an increase in the personal space bubble between oneself and the grid, which is something that I myself do. Also seeing yourself during video chats constantly in real time is fatiguing. I find it to be annoying too. Um, and, and I, you know, I tend to be very critical of myself anyway, and then having to look at myself constantly um, while I'm presenting or while I'm in a meeting and speaking. Um, most video platforms will show a square of what you look like on camera during the chat, but that's unnatural in the real world because if someone was following you around with a mirror constantly, it, you know, in the real world, uh, so that while you were talking to people, making decisions and giving feedback and getting feedback, you're seeing yourself in a mirror. I mean, that would be crazy. You know, there's just no comparison to it. But when you see a reflection of yourself, you know, you're like I just said, you're much more critical of yourself. Um, looking at ourselves on video chats can be very taxing and stressful. So what can you do about that? Well, you can use the hide self view button and you can access access that by right clicking on your um, own photo. And once you see your face is framed properly in the, the video. So it's just one thing that you can do, but also, um, you know, video chats dramatically reduce our usual mobility. In-person and phone conversations can allow us to walk around and move a little bit. With video conferencing, most cameras have a view of, have a field of view, which means a person has to generally stay in the same spot. Movement is limited in ways that are not really natural. So what's the solution to that? Well, people really need to think about the room they're video conferencing in. 
where the camera is positioned and whether things like an external keyboard can help create distance or flexibility. Um, an external camera farther away from the screen will allow you to pace and to doodle. Standing desks are also great help. Um, turning one's video off periodically during meetings is a good ground rule to set for groups. You know, at the beginning of the meeting, you can tell people, if you're comfortable, leave your camera on. If you're not, go ahead and feel free to turn it off at any time during the meeting. And during those times, get up and stretch and do whatever you need to do to get yourself more comfortable. Um, especially if it's a long meeting, you don't fall over when you go to stand up for the first time afterwards. Um, also, the cognitive load is much higher in video chats. In face-to-face -face communications, nonverbal communication is really quite natural. But in video chats, we really need to work harder to send and receive signals. And we have to take on one of the most natural things in the world, which is an in-person conversation, and transform it into something that involves a lot of thought. You need to make sure your head is framed in the center of the video. If you agree with someone, you have to do an exaggerated nod or put your thumbs up. That adds cognitive load as you're using mental calories to communicate. So what's the solution to this? During the long stretch of meeting, stretches of meetings, give yourself an audio only break. Um, it's not simply just turning off your camera, but take a break from having to be non-verbally active. Also turning your body away from the screen so that for a few minutes you're not smothered with gestures that are perpetually realistic but socially meaningless. So let's talk a little bit about um, better meeting planning leads to less burnout. You know, you want to audit your reoccurring meetings and cut any that really haven't been productive. So take a good hard look at your um, regularly scheduled meetings. Make sure that you only invite people who are critical to be there. They really have to be there. Send out an agenda and make sure you stick to that agenda. Make reoccurring meetings, opt in for non-essential people whenever possible. And to improve social interaction, spend the first few minutes of a meeting um, asking what's going on in your colleagues' lives. You know, just a little um, kind of breaking the ice chit chat. It really helps to build some of those connections that we're losing in the face-to-face -face environment. And while there are benefits to using Zoom, don't use it you know, when an email or a phone call or a text message will work just as well. You really don't need to see the other person many times to get them point across. And you know, I'm talking about Zoom, he'll, Zoom here, but it applies to any kind of um, conferencing software that you're using. Maybe you use Teams. You know, we use both um, at the State Library. So better meeting attendance, you know, leads to more productive sessions. Try to show up on time. Um, just as you would not show up late to an in-person meeting, respect others' time by showing up on time or even be there waiting early. I'll tell you, the one thing that makes me crazy is like in uh, for Teams meetings is there's constantly a chat box that comes up that says such, you know, somebody's waiting to be let into the room. And if somebody doesn't let them into the room right away, it's really annoying. And people will be coming in for the at any time during the first 20 minutes of some of these meetings that we have. Makes me crazy. Um, make sure that you have the video link handy so you aren't scrambling around at the last minute trying to find it. You know, make sure that you've got it um, in the invite of your calendar so it's easy to find. Also, be professional and prepared. A virtual meeting is still a meeting. You know, are you having a bad hair day? Are you wearing your break, your breakfast by any chance? Put on a clean shirt. Put on a professional looking shirt. Nobody cares what you're wearing from the waist down, but, you know, from the waist up, if you can look a little more professional, it helps. Um, move your computer to a place with a more professional looking background. You know, and you can also use some of those um, background filters where you can have different backgrounds set up for you. Be really careful with those and you might want to try them out as a test with somebody else. Because what I found with some of them is they're, they're more distracting than anything. And I've got to be honest with you, I'm, I'm one who suffers from migraines. And some of them, I'm concerned, will trigger a migraine with me because what happens is they start to kind of like vibrate a little bit. And when people will gesture, especially if they're um, very expressive people when they're talking, then um, parts of their hands and their arms and their bodies will disappear and reappear again, 
which can be really um, annoying. <laughs> and so, you know, be really, really careful with those background uh, filters and be considerate about um, other, you know, with other people. Also, um, you know, take a quick break, you know, before um, you get on into your meeting, you know, to get your mind ready and to get focused before you log on, you know, grab coffee or water or whatever you need before the meeting starts. And while it can be tempting, don't multitask during the meeting. Focus on the people at the topic at hand. Just because you're being separated from a, from a computer screen doesn't give you liberty to be working on another project or have another screen up and answering emails at the same time. What you want to do is silence your phone, close out your outlook, don't eat, don't walk away, you know, put your phone on to vibrate. And also, um, don't interrupt. Don't derail purposeful threads or channels with off-topic conversations. And clarity means expressing your, your point simply and directly. And consciousness means not wasting words. So what we're going to do now is we're going to watch a video. And um, Christine, I think you're going to put the link into the chat box. Yes. So Adobe Connect works a little bit wonky with videos. So what we're going to do is have you click on the link that I put in chat. It's going to open in a new window for you. Um, they do it uh, because of copyright, I believe. Um, it's going to open in a new window for you. You're going to watch the video, which is about four minutes long. And then when you come back, um, you can raise your hand um, up at the top. Um, and, um, And I know we only have a couple minutes left. Yeah, I just have um, a, just a couple of quick words to say on this last slide here um, about being forgiving. Um, you know, the one thing that we need to remember is for many of us, working remotely is an unexpected and unwelcome necessity during the pandemic. And some people thrive working remotely. And for others, it's really a struggle. Um, many of us have kids home from school with us now and adding extra distractions. And on top of everything, many of us, even those who are accustomed to working from home, are dealing with new and uncomfortable challenges and emotions. And so what we need to do is really cut each other a little slack and practice another vital soft skill that will help us survive this time, both professionally and personally, and that being empathy. And as you've all come back, I wanted to thank you all very much for joining us today. And if you would, um, if you have a chance to, if you could fill out our evaluation, um, we would really, really appreciate it to let us know how we did today and if we met your expectations. So um, you can either click right on the slide uh, to fill out our evaluation, or I am going to copy and paste it into chat for you. Um, once again, we'd love to know what you liked about it, what, what you didn't. It is 100% um, uh, anonymous. That was a hard word for me to think of. Um, and for those of you um, who may be interested, um, uh, the archive will be available later this afternoon at um, the website listed on the screen, which I will also put into chat. And our next CSLN session is going to be on Thursday, October 14th, when we are going to discuss bias in information. So that should be another good one as well. So let me put the, um, the website in chat. It'll probably be uh, later this afternoon, uh, like in a couple hours. Um, but do feel free to um, share the archive with colleagues, um, other people who maybe couldn't attend today. Um, our our uh, archives are always freely available for um, you to come and grab later. So once again, I want to thank you all for attending and I want to um, thank Jean Heilig for presenting such fabulous information on a very important topic. Thanks everyone and I hope you have a great rest of your afternoon.